Good evening and welcome to our uh, evening installment of uh, Wednesday Bible study here at Park Avenue Missionary Baptist Church, where the Reverend Ellie Camp was pastor. We praise the Lord that uh, you are joining us in cyberspace and those of you who are in the uh, sanctuary uh, this evening. Uh, we uh, have an interesting lesson this week, a very good lesson, I believe. This is lesson six, dated for April 7th, 2024. And we're in the second unit called A Measure of Faith. And our subject is uh, helping a friend in need. Helping a friend in need. So we're gonna start with a, uh, a word of prayer and then we're going to get moving on to our lesson. Let's, uh, let's look to the Lord. Father in heaven, thank you once more uh, for the privilege of assembling uh, in this house with these people. We thank and praise you for your goodness and your mercy. We thank you for your only begotten son uh, who died, rose again that we might live we thank and praise you, Lord, for the Holy Spirit and his indwelling power. And we pray that, Father, as we go forward tonight, that he will lead and guide us in the way we should go. We ask a uh, blessing on those who will be uh, presenting uh, this evening. Uh, give us clarity of thought and speech as we teach your people uh, what you say in your word. We ask a special blessing upon our pastor. We pray that you uh, keep him and guide him and direct him and provide for his needs as you've done all these years of service to you. So we thank and praise you, Father. We uh, pray that you take us down into uh, the depths of uh, your word and pull back the curtains of our mind and help us rightly divide the word of truth as we go forward. Thank you for those that are here. We thank you for those that are on their way. We thank you for those that have joined us in cyberspace this evening. So, Father, as uh, always, uh, our prayer is that we glorify and magnify you and edify the saints of God. We ask these blessings in Jesus' name and for sake we pray. Amen. Amen and thank God. All right, we have, again, the subject, helping a friend in need. Uh, our uh, um, devotional reading is found in the Gospel of John, the fourth chapter, the fourth through the 18th verses. We encourage you to read that. Our background scripture is found in the book of Luke, the fifth chapter, the 17th through the 26th verses. And our print passage is the same. And uh, we'll read our key verse in the King James Version. And uh, we'll get into our lesson. Behold, men brought in a bed a man which was taken with palsy. And they sought means to bring him in and to lay him before him. And when they could not find by what way they might bring him in, because of the multitude, they went upon the housetop and let him down through the tiling with his couch into the mist before Jesus. That's our key verse. Um, found in Luke, the fifth chapter, the 18th and 19th verses. Uh, we're going to see about the loyalty of friends and uh, when our subject of this lesson, the man on the cot, meant Jesus. He had an encounter with Jesus. For our uh, lesson aims 
Uh, we strive, we will strive to understand the importance of Christian friends in building up faith in Christ. Uh, we value the encouragement and support that we can offer each other uh, in the faith. And thirdly, seek to create habits of compassion and faith-filled actions. We have some key terms we encourage you to um, pursue. And uh, they are entitled forgiven, um, found in the verse 23, heal, found in verse 17, paralyzed, found in verse 24, and the Pharisees found in verses in verse 17. We uh, invite you, those of you who have your books, to read the introduction and the biblical context on your own, and you will derive uh, uh, a good deal of information uh, from, uh, from them. We have two analyses of the biblical text. Uh, the first one is friendship finds a way. Friendship finds a way. Found in Luke, the fifth chapter, the 17th through the 20th verses. And the second analysis of the biblical text is friendship's reward. Friendship's reward. Found in Luke, the fifth chapter, uh, the 21st through the 26th verses. Um, Let's go to, we read our key verse, let's go into some background uh, in our lesson uh, this evening. Now, uh, this particular book uh, was penned by Luke, who was a physician, he was a Gentile, and a travel companion of the Apostle Paul. Luke is the only New Testament writer clearly identifiable as a non-Jew. He authored the Gospel of Luke as well as the sequel, the Book of Acts. And the earliest possible date for Luke and Acts appears to be immediately uh, following immediately after the events in uh, the Book of Acts, uh, the 28th chapter. Um, so this would have been around A.D. 62. Now, although he does not name himself in his books, Paul mentions Luke by name in three epistles. And both Luke and Acts uh, are addressed to the same person, Theophilus. Uh, Theophilus uh, um, was probably a new Christian, a fairly new Christian, he had received the basics of the Christian doctrine, but had not yet been completely grounded uh, in them, so uh, um, the doctrine. So Theophilus, who was probably a uh, um, maybe an aristocrat or one who was uh, 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 well, uh, I don't know wealthy, but he was a person of means, it appears. So these books are both addressed to Theophilus. Now, Luke was a close friend of Paul who referred to him as the beloved physician, uh, as the beloved physician found in Colossians 4 and 14. Uh, Luke's interest in medicine is probably the reason his gospel gives such a high profile to Jesus' acts of healing. Uh, Luke's gospel is characterized uh, by its literary quality and attention to detail. Uh, Luke wrote in high Greek, um, and uh, um, it, it's, it's clear in the writings and of course, attention to, to detail. Um, and, and that brings to mind you know, the, the story of Jesus' birth. Luke uh, got that information undoubtedly from, uh, from Mary uh, and her uh, recollections, her experience in, in when Jesus was born. 
Now, Luke, as a companion to uh, Paul, he played a significant role in spreading the gospel of Christ and the early Christian movement. Um, Luke's writings provide valuable insights into the life, the teachings, and the miracles of Jesus, as well as the growth of the early Christian church. And you can find um, uh, uh, examples of this as you read through the Gospel of Luke and also through the book, uh, The Acts of the Holy Spirit, through the apostles. All right, as we mentioned before, we have two analysis of the biblical text. Uh, the first analysis is friendship finds a way, found in Luke, the fifth chapter, the 17th through the 20th verses, and also uh, the fri friendship's reward, found in Luke, the fifth chapter, the 21st through the 26th verses. So we're going to be laboring uh, for a bit uh, in these verses uh, um, of, uh, of this passage. All right, so let's, uh, let's start with uh, the first analysis of the biblical text. Friendship finds a way. Friendship finds a way. Let's read that 17th verse together. One day, Jesus was teaching, and Pharisees and teachers of the law were sitting there. They had come from every village of Galilee and from Judea and Jerusalem. And the power of the Lord was with Jesus to heal the sick. So we know that Jesus had begun his earthly ministry and uh, the Pharisees and, and the lawyers or the scribes, they came to Galilee from local villages and as far away as Judea and Jerusalem to hear Jesus' teaching. Now, we know that uh, uh, any community that had a synagogue, in order to have a synagogue, uh, they had to have at least 12 adult Jewish males uh, in, um, in the, uh, the area. And so the, the Pharisees uh, and, and the scribes, they came to hear Jesus' teaching. And we're going to see that they're always going to come with a critical or a jaundiced eye uh, toward Jesus and what uh, he was sharing. So uh, we find here that when we read the fourth and fifth chapter of Luke, uh, we learn that the power of the Holy Spirit uh, was upon Jesus. And in this power, Jesus healed the sick of many diseases. So Jesus, this was his earthly ministry that had that begun we know uh, Jesus' earthly ministry began with the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit kicked him out, uh, Brother Taylor, into the, in, into the wilderness to be tempted by Satan. And, and, uh, um, uh, but, but he had the power of the Holy Spirit, and he was able to withstand the temptation. And as we learned from, from Brother Greg in his teaching about Christ, that um, we, we've learned here that uh, uh, Jesus uh, uh, didn't have the ability to sin. Uh, he didn't think about sinning. Uh, and, and so, uh, but as I believe as an example to us, uh, Jesus uh, dealt with temptation uh, through the word of God. And Jesus is our model, and that's how we should deal uh, with, with temptation. So Jesus is indwelled by the power of the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit is with him. Uh, he's empowered by, uh, by the spirit of uh, the triune God. Uh, 
Let's read verse 18 uh, and 19 and 20. And this is the NIV, by the way. Some men came carrying a paralyzed man on a mat and tried to take him into the house to lay him before Jesus. When they could not find a way to do this because of the crowd, they went up on the roof and lowered him on his mat through the tiles into the middle of the crowd, right in front of Jesus. And when Jesus saw their faith, he said, friend, your sins are forgiven. So here is a man who's paralyzed. Um, we can deduce from what Jesus said that uh, the man's problem was sin. And this had led to his paralysis. So these friends of this man uh, were tried to carry him into the house where Jesus uh, was healing. And they were unable to uh, get through uh, at this time. You know, Jesus is at a place in his ministry where he's found favor with the crowds and they're pressing uh, to uh, see him. Uh, they're bringing individuals who are infirmed and, and sick to him for healing. But these men, um, Luke reports that as Jesus was healing, some men came, they were carrying the paralyzed man on a mat, and they tried to get their friend into the house to see Jesus. Uh, because of the crowd, they were unable to get through. So instead, what did these men do? Did they give up, turn around and go home? No. Instead, they went up to the roof of the house and removed some of the tiles uh, um, of the roof they lowered their friend down in front of Jesus. A tremendous uh, display of, of faith and their desire uh, for their friend to be healed. Uh, these men were determined. And I recall as a, as a little boy, uh, Sister Ollie Campbell, my auntie, taught us this lesson um, about the, uh, the paralyzed man and about the faithfulness of his friends. That, that, uh, uh, that teaching, that story stays, stays with me. Uh, now, Jesus saw the men's faith, and uh, uh, he, he uh, ignored Brother Stan, the man's physical needs. Jesus did that. He went, he went right to the heart of the matter. And the heart of the matter was the man's sins. He says, man, your sins are forgiven you. Your sins are forgiven you. Uh, so Jesus knows our hearts. Uh, and in his omniscien, omniscience, we know uh, that he sees all, knows all. So he tells the man that your sins are forgiven you. Now, it appears that uh, the man's uh, root problem, of course, was his sin. That had caused his paralysis. And this man's healing had been preordained. Uh, the purpose of this event was to demonstrate Jesus' authority to save and to heal. So this, this event didn't just happen uh, uh, because... Uh, um, uh, Jesus thought about just, he, he just went about healing the man, but this was a confirmation of who Jesus said he was, the Son of Man. Uh, and, and so uh, we're going to find here that the Pharisees had an issue with that. But the purpose, again, I have to restate, was that uh, uh, the purpose of this whole event was to demonstrate Jesus' authority 
to first save and heal. So when we, uh, when we encounter Jesus, when he crosses our path, the thing that we need first is salvation. We need to be saved first from our condition. And, and uh, uh, Jesus uh, was not only doing that, but it was a confirmation of his messiahship. That's important for us to, uh, to realize, to, to know that Jesus wasn't just healing to be healing. There was a reason uh, behind uh, what he, he was doing. Now, the people who were being healed, they came for a totally different, different reason. And, and, but but uh, 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 Jesus was going about uh, his ministry, and part of this was this, this healing of the sick was a confirmation uh, of who he was and is. Let's go to our second analysis of the biblical text, and it is uh, friendship's reward. Friendship's reward found in Luke, the fifth chapter, the 21st through the 26th verses. And let's read those verses together. The Pharisees and the teachers of the law began thinking to themselves, who is this fellow who speaks blasphemy? And who can forgive sins but God alone? Jesus knew what they were thinking and asked, why are you thinking these things in your hearts? Which is easier to say, your sins are forgiven, or to say, get up and walk? But I want you to know that the Son of Man has authority on earth to forgive sins. So he said to the paralyzed man, I tell you, get up, take your mat, and go home. Jesus understood what they were saying. And, you know, the Pharisees followed Jesus around. They were the scribes. They were very critical, always critical, always trying to watch and see if he made a mistake. They would confront him and try to tangle him in his talk. But uh, Jesus never uh, was uh, 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 tangled up like uh, these guys wished, but even even their attitude toward him. I got to go back to the twenty second, twenty first verse. The Pharisees and the teachers of the law begin thinking to themselves, thinking to themselves, "Who is this fellow?" Now that smacks of of uh, um, disrespect to me, right there. Who is this fellow who speaks blasphemy? Who can forgive sin but God alone? Now, Jesus being omniscient, okay, he knew what they were thinking. And so he asked them straight out. He said, why are you thinking these things in your heart? Why, why, why is that lurking? And as we covered this morning, uh, um, we know that everything starts with the heart, right? When man is, 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 is thinking uh, 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 in error, uh, when man is sinning, it starts in the heart. Then it manifests itself uh, um, uh, by the actions that follow uh, that thinking. So... Here, Jesus is asking them, uh, why, why are you saying these things in, in your heart? Why are you thinking this? What's easier to say? Your sins are forgiven or to say, get up and walk? And Jesus says it himself, what the, the point we've been trying to make, I want you to know, he says, that the Son of Man has authority on earth to forgive sins, to forgive sins. So he said to the paralyzed man, I tell you, get up, 
get your mat and go home. So hearing Jesus' words, the scribes and the Pharisees began thinking to themselves that uh, Jesus was speaking blasphemy. Now, they correctly deduced that only God can forgive sin, yet they did not realize they were in the presence of the God-man himself. As MacArthur points out, Jesus' words to the man were an unequivocal claim of divine authority. So what Jesus said established that he had the authority to not only heal physically, but more importantly, to save. And he had possessed that authority. And, and uh, what's exciting is, is that, you know, the Lord is, is really something because he's, he tied our Sunday school lesson to what we're learning uh, uh, about Christ, the study of, of, of uh, uh, Christ, Christology, uh, and, and uh, um, covering uh, the fact that the Lord has all power, and that power he has possessed, he uh, possessed it since eternity past, eternity past. And so uh, Jesus' words were, were I, I agree with MacArthur, they were uh, an equivocal claim of divine authority. Now, not everyone who is disabled in instances where when Jesus healed, every, everyone wasn't, uh, uh, hadn't, hadn't sinned. And let me, let me uh, share this with you in John 9. The, the ninth chapter of the Gospel of John, the first three verses uh, read this way. As he went along, he saw a man blind from birth. His disciples asked him, Rabbi, who sinned, this man or his parents, that he was born blind? Neither this man nor his parents sinned, said Jesus, but this happened so that the works of God might be displayed in him. See, the Lord does things uh, uh, through us to prove who he is, to glorify himself. Now, we need to uh, uh, understand why the disciples would ask this question. Why would they ask Jesus that? Hey, Rabbi, who, who sinned? This man? or his parents. And so Jesus let them know that this man hadn't sinned. And, and in, in his answer to them, uh, Jesus debunked the belief, which was a, uh, a belief during that time, that any person with a disability, whether they were blind, paralyzed, or, or what, had a, you know, uh, anything uh, that uh, um, they, they were basically damned. They were sinners, and, and they were damned. And uh, uh, conversely, anyone who was rich, who was successful, uh, they were blessed by God. This is, this is what they taught. This is what the people believed at that time. And as we can see here, in that passage, uh, John 9, 1 through 3, that the disciples believed it too. They were, they were uh, 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 um, uh, they were, their culture had them, for lack of a better word, chained. Their, their culture had them in a certain mindset. And so uh, um, the Lord dealt with that. But look what Jesus said again. I got to read this again. But this happened so that the works of God might be displayed in him. The Lord demonstrates his power, his sovereignty, his omnipotence 
through uh, dealings with us. And, and uh, uh, many times, uh, in, in times of adversity or, or whatever, uh, the Lord demonstrates his power through his children. We, uh, uh, we are, uh, uh, in many times, an, an example uh, um, witnessing the glory of the Lord and, and through uh, the actions, through what the Lord, through how the Lord works with us, it demonstrate, he demonstrates his power and his, his glory. So Jesus clearly was saying that this, this man didn't sin, his parents didn't sin. And as I said, this, this, but, but this was for uh, the glory of God, what Jesus was getting ready to do. And I encourage this morning, the class, to read that ninth chapter of John. Read the whole chapter and get a better understanding. And you'll see what, uh, uh, what this man went through uh, uh, because Jesus healed him. I mean, he, he, went, he went through something because he was blind. He received his sight. And instead of people being happy, the, the powers that be being happy for the man, <laughs> they were questioning. Put him out to synagogue. His parents were afraid to even say much because they were afraid of being put out of the synagogue. So, uh, uh, but Jesus works uh, uh, through our adversity to demonstrate his power and who he is. So this is what Jesus told uh, uh, the, the scribes and in, in, in the Pharisees because their criticism was leveled at him, uh, did not go unnoticed by him. So their attitude their, their murmuring, their, their thoughts, actually, uh, um, were clear to Jesus. In his omniscience, he asked the question, why are you thinking these things in your hearts? Why, why, why is your heart, why are your hearts uh, um, um, leveled on, on, on this, on this thought? Why are you being critical? What's easier to say? Your sins are forgiven or to say get up and walk? So Jesus told the scribes and the Pharisees that the purpose of the man's healing was to demonstrate that the Son of Man had authority on earth to forgive sins. He says it, he says it right, right in verse 24. But I want you to know that the Son of Man has authority on earth to forgive sins. This authority. So he tells him, all right, get up and walk. And so knowing this, Jesus commanded, and if you look at the Greek, that was a command. He commanded the man to rise up and then go home. Get up, go home. And let's read what 25 and 26 say. Immediately, he stood up in front of them, took what he had been lying on, and went home praising God. Everyone was amazed and gave praise to God. They were filled with awe and said, we have seen remarkable things today. So when Jesus gave the command, this man immediately, there was no hesitation, there was nothing. This paralyzed man, we don't know how long he was paralyzed, but he got up, he received strength in his body, and he stood up in front of everybody and he stood up immediately, as soon as Jesus said it. Another confirmation of Jesus' power and authority. And the man did as he was 
uh, uh, commanded. He picked up his bed and he went home. The Bible says, glorifying God for his healing. The man went home glorifying God for his healing. The man was physically healed, and that's good, but more importantly, he was spiritually healed. And we know that happened first. What's the first thing Jesus said to him? Man, your sins are forgiven you. Friend, your sins are forgiven you. And, and so uh, that was the important thing. And this, I believe, was the source of his praise. His healing was personal. See, in, 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 until we've had a personal encounter with God, we, we really don't know how to glorify him and magnify him. But this man, uh, uh, Jesus, crossed his path, and he was healed. Whatever that sin was, it was lifted. Jesus forgave it. And for that, this man glorified God. And when you look at the Greek there, it, it indicates that he kept on. He didn't just say one time glorifying God. He glorified God all the way home. He's probably glorifying God in the house uh, for what the Lord had done for him. He probably knew his sin, and he knew what uh, uh, Jesus had done for him. He had a personal encounter with our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Now, conversely, the crowd was amazed at what they had witnessed. They were astonished by what they saw. So amazed and astonished. Hadn't seen anything like that. And they praise God for what they witness. But I don't believe their praise was like the man who had been healed. Their praise was based upon what they saw. But the man's praise was based upon his personal encounter with our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. That man was changed forever. That day he was changed forever, and he was a walking witness of what Jesus could do. Walking witness. When people looked at him in his town, they said, there goes that guy. He know he was paralyzed all these years, and look, he's walking today. But they hadn't had. A, uh, a personal encounter with Jesus. They were awed. Yes, sister. <laughs> well, the Bible doesn't say that, but, you know, knowing human nature, <laughs> they may have said it. <laughs> we don't know. The Bible doesn't specifically deal with that. But, uh, uh, so, but, but the Pharisees, Sister Livingston, and the scribes, they learned a lesson. They learned a lesson that day. Uh, it didn't change them, but they couldn't deny what they saw. And, and so that's why they spent so much time following Jesus around and criticizing him, criticizing his, his ministry. But the important thing is that this man had a personal encounter with the Lord. He was healed, and Jesus, in healing this man, also demonstrated who he is and the fact that he has authority, all power in his hand, right? Okay. Amen. Yes, ma'am. Yeah. 
That's right. It is. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Amen. It's wonderful to know. And, and if we look deep, we, there was a crowd, right? They couldn't get the man in the house because of the crowd. And all those people saw that man brought in, saw, saw, him, saw him lowered down in front of Jesus, and they saw him walk out with his mat, walk out with what he was like. So can, can you imagine his hometown, what the buzz was all around. But he had a personal encounter with Jesus. And we know, each and every one of us says here, we know that we were changed when we had a personal encounter with our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. So this is our lesson for this week, our Sunday school lesson, Helping a Friend in Need found in Luke 5, 17 through 26. God bless you. Amen.
get ready at this time for our prayer meeting. We're going to start with uh, scripture tonight, taken from Psalm 91. He who dwells in the secret place of the Most High shall abide under the shadow of the Almighty. I will say unto the Lord, He is my refuge and my fortress. My God, in him I will trust. Surely he shall deliver you from the snares of the fowl and from the perilous pestilence. He shall cover you with his, his feathers, and under his wings he shall take refuge. His truth shall be your shield and buckler. You shall not be afraid of the fear by night, nor the arrows of the fire fly by day, nor the flesh that walks in the darkness, nor the destruction that lies waste at no noonday. A thousand may fall on your side, and ten thousand on the right side, but, but it shall not come near you. Only with your eyes shall you look and see and reward of the wicked. Because you have made the Lord, Lord, who is my refuge, even the most high, even your dwelling place. No evil shall befall you, nor shall my plague come near your dwelling. For he shall give his angels charge over you to keep you in, in all the way your ways. In their hands they shall bear you up, lest you dash your foot against the stone. And ye shall tread upon lions and cobras. The young lions shall and the serpents shall tr tramp under your foot. Because he has set his love upon me, therefore I will deliver him. I will set him on the high, because he has known my name. He shall call upon me, and I will answer him. I will be with him in trouble. He will deliver him and honor him. With all life, with long life, I will satisfy him and show him my salvation. I love you. Read your Psalm 91. May God add a blessing to the readers and hearers of this word. At this time, we have prayer and praise report. Praise report at this time before prayer. All right. All right. What a friend. That's great. That's right. He gave us his son. He gave this world the gift. He took our rebound and gave us to him. That's why we can say I'm still looking for my father. He gave me very body so I can see the father. That's right. That's right. Amen. Praise God. Yeah, this reminds me of our Sunday school lesson today. You know. God will forgive us.
Sure. There's, yeah, so many things that we are thankful for, and so many things that we ha have to continue to praise God Amen. for. Amen. Father, in the name of Jesus, we come to you once again just to say thank you, thank you for your grace, and thank you for your mercy, Father. Just thank you for the opportunity just to call on your holy and precious name, Father. We thank you, Father, for waking us up early this morning, Father, and showing us on to see a brand new day, Father. Oh, Father, we ask that you bless those that are on the prayer list tonight, Father. Touch them in a special way, Father, like you, only you can, Father. We read in the Sunday school lesson that you can heal and forgive tonight, Father. And that's why we're going to praise you, Father, because you've been able to do all things for prayer, Father. That's why we're going to continue to give you the praise because you're worthy of all our praises. We just thank you tonight, Father, for this opportunity just to call on your precious and holy name. We thank you, and we're going to continue to give you praise. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen, and thank God. Well, on that note, I better tell my praise report, too. Uh, <laughs> I have a little issue with my heart. And the other night, it started racing. My heart started racing again. This is what ended my flying career a little prematurely. <laughs> but uh, uh, so I'm, this is about 1.30 in the morning because it, it woke me up. I, it, was, it, was, it was racing so much. So I went to the, uh, so I said, well, I'm going to the emergency room and let them figure it out. And bless the Lord, when I got to, by the time I got to the hospital, the guy says, your heart's in sinus rhythm. That means it's now it's beating normally. Yeah, because my, I mean, because, you know, I, when, when I feel my, when I feel the rumble in my chest, I just put my watch on and say, let's see what's going on. And I'm sitting in, I'm just, I, I'm, I mean, I'm, I'm woken out of my sleep because of it. And my heart rate was like 125. And I said, okay. And I sat there and I washed it. It dropped all the way down to 42. And then next thing you know, it's all up again. So I, I went on down to the emergency room. And then by the time I got there, the heart was fine. <laughs> Atrial fibrillation. Atrial fibrillation. So that's the condition that I have, is atrial fibrillation. And we were, uh, uh, last September, you know, they shocked me back into, uh, back into normal rhythm. Yes. That's why I wasn't here for Women's Day. I was in, I was in Anchorage getting shocked. <laughs> On Sheree's birthday. <laughs> so that's my praise report. So, so it's... Uh, yeah, it's... Well, it's... It, and, and it was kind of interesting what the guy told me. Uh, when I was there, uh, 
uh, when I was in the emergency room, he says, look, man, if, 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 he says, we can shock you right back. He says, but in order for us to shock you, you got to be out of rhythm. <laughs> he says, so you, he said, you're doing everything you're supposed to do? And so, so it all worked out well. And uh, uh, so, I, I, and I thought to myself, I said, why am I going to the doctor? All I can do is talk to Sheree. <laughs> Tell me, tell, me, tell me what drugs I should be doing. Tell me what I should be doing about these drugs. Yeah, oh yeah. yeah. Yep, that is a fact. Yeah, turn it, turn, turn it on the uh, YouTube video of 10 hours of rainfall. <laughs> ask me how, ask me how I know. <laughs> uh, it's just a condition that I have. Yeah, and ironically, uh, uh, before I went to the uh, before I went to the hospital, I said, "Well, let me just take another dose of meds," because I had already taken my night meds. But I said, "Well, let me take another dose," and and then by the time I got there, it was it was uh, it back in uh, sinus rhythm. And and I was kind of glad to hear that, because at least I wasn't in AFib. Yeah. So, all right, here we go. Christology. We talked about we're talking about Christology. We've talked about uh, a lot of things. Who can tell me? Who can tell me what uh, Christology means? Or what is what are we talking about when we talk about the doctrine of Jesus Christ in terms of Christology? If you ain't if you ain't cheap, you ain't trying. <laughs> All right, Sister Green, we're waiting on you. <laughs> Thank you, sir. We have spent a lot of time talking about Christ's person. Uh, we've talked about the deity of uh, Christ. We've talked about his eternality, his preexistence. We've talked about the incarnation. We talked about the humanity of Jesus Christ. We talked about the hypostatic union. We talked about the temptation. Now we're directing our attention towards Christ's work. We are dressing, we're turning our attention towards Christ's work as we take a look at the ministry of Christ. Like I told him this morning, uh, I wanted to try to finish up today, but this, was, this is one we can't rush. Uh, don't want to rush through this one. And uh, if anybody wants to uh, help me out tonight, I, 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 
I, I need a reader, so if you uh, would like to do that, uh, I'm going to let you have that mic over there, and we'll trade off on reading scripture, because this one is so biblically based, uh, we have to take the time and look at the scriptures as, uh, as they are relative to uh, the work of Christ, because the biblical, we're, we're building a solid biblical foundation on the work of Christ. Uh, and Pastor, I'm actually looking forward to getting to the uh, present work of Christ uh, as well as we take a look at that. And uh, so we'll see how far we get tonight. But uh, if I don't finish tonight, we'll finish this, this, the, the study of Christology uh, next week. But anyway, the ministry of Christ. Now, and, and, and I, I don't know if I did a very good job of uh, doing this this morning, so I want to take make sure I do this uh, a little better than I did this morning. But the ministry of Christ, the ministry of Jesus Christ, is in response to the plan of God established long before the foundation of the world. Uh, there's a song by the Winans. Uh, uh, it's, it's, it's not a haphazard event or a secondary scheme, uh, but it was always has been the Lord's plan to redeem. In other words, the gist of the song was that the fall of Adam and Eve in the garden didn't cause God to change his plan. He didn't say, okay, we got to go to a plan B. Our, our salvation was worked out long before the foundation of the world. So was, the ministry of Christ Jesus is in response to the plan of God established before the foundation of the world. All right? Now, we're going to review just briefly the significance of John 1.1 1, 1 compared to Genesis 1.1. 1, 1. You know that John 1.1 1, 1 says, In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. I wanted to make sure I didn't mess that up. So here I am in John 1.1. 1, 1. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. And Genesis 1.1 says, in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. Now, if you're looking to see where, you, where, where I am in your handout, if you're in part two, we're picking it up on page eight. Is that what page we said it was on, Sister, uh, no. Sister Libby? Page nine. Page nine. We're looking at the ministry of Christ. And I'm just giving you my introductory comments to it. Okay, because that's where we're headed. We're dealing with with the ministry of Christ. But again, the ministry of Jesus Christ is in response to the plan of God established long before the foundation of the world. And we talked about the relationship between John 1.1 1, 1 and Genesis 1.1. 1, 1. We said that John 1.1 1, 1 establishes uh, the pre-existence and the eternality of Jesus Christ. And then we said that G Genesis 1.1 1, 1, actually establishes the foundation of the world. Everybody with me there? Genesis 1-1 being the foundation of the world. So sometime between John 1-1, which is undateable, and Genesis 1-1, God had already worked out your salvation because it was established long before the foundation of the world. John 1.1 1, 1 establishes the pre-existence and second person of the Jesus, uh, the pre-existence of the second person of the Godhead manifested in Jesus Christ. Genesis 1.1 1, 1 marks the beginning of the foundation of the world. So the statement made in Ephesians chapter 1, verses 3 through 6, fall within that particular time frame. Ephesians chapter 1, verses 3 through 6 reads. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us with every spiritual blessing in heavenly places in Christ. Here it is. Just as he chose us in him before the foundation of the world. Just as he chose us in him before the foundation of the world, that we should be holy and without blame before him in love. That we should be holy and without blame before him in love, having predestined us to the adoption as sons by Jesus Christ to himself, according to the good pleasure of his will, to the praise of the glory of his grace, by which 
he has made us accepted in the beloved. So that means, Stanley Green, that regardless of what year you were born, God chose you in him before Genesis 1-1, before the foundation of the world. Brother Taylor, Sister Taylor, Sister Lanisha, you were already chosen. God already knew. He already saw you. He already had you on his mind before he ever said, before the, it was ever written, in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. He already established it, already established our, our, uh, our salvation. And the reason, though, is what's, what's uh, interesting to me, and I'll get to that in a minute. But several points in the text deserve consideration. Several points in the text deserve consideration. What he has done for us, he has done through Christ Jesus before the foundation of the world. That's number one. Point one. Point two, God did it according to the good pleasure of his will. He did it according to the good pleasure of his will. And then this is the one that's most striking to me about this particular passage. It was for the, and the purpose for why he did it was for the praise of the glory of his grace. In other words, the root of our praise, the root of our worship is in response to God's grace. God's grace takes center stage as being the root for our worship, our praise. Our, the, it's the highest expression, if you will, of our gratitude for what God has done on our behalf. And he did this long before the foundation of the world. There are many things we can praise God for, many things, but the chiefest of them all is the work that he has done to bring about our salvation. It was not for the praise of the glory of his preeminence. It was not for the praise of the glory of his creation. It is not for the praise of his omnipotence, but it is for the praise of his glory, of the glory of his grace manifested in the Word, in the Word becoming flesh. For this is how he brought about our redemption. And the analogy that I use this morning, the analogy that I use, because this is something that's astounding to me, is number one, how long, how long did it take God to create the heavens and the earth? What'd you say, Sharon? Six days. It took them six days to create everything that you and I see. Six days. How long did it take for him to accomplish your salvation? The working out of our salvation took thousands of years. Thousands of years. And so, and again, uh, I, I am caught up on the uh, glory of his grace. All right. And it is for this reason that we bless God and the Father of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. The glory of God is not manifested in creation, but the ultimate manifestation is in the grace of God extended to us in the person and ministry of his only begotten Son. And then I go back to John 1.14, for the word was, became flesh and dwelt among us, and we beheld his glory, the glory, as the only begotten of the Father, and notice what it says, full of grace and truth. So, then I said the initial manifestation of this grace and the plan of salvation was set in motion by the command he gave to Adam. The, the command Adam received from the Lord. The Lord commanded the man saying, from every tree of the garden you may eat freely, but from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil you shall not eat, for on the day that you eat from it you will surely die. How many of you know that God already knew that Adam was going to fall. And the fall, 
already knowing that he was going to fall, set in motion the plan that he had already established long before the foundation of the world. So we see this as the initial, the initial cause or the initial action leading to our salvation because he knew he was going to fall. Everybody with me? And then I, I made this point, and I don't want to beat this point too much, but I made this point this morning that I didn't realize, and this is the first time I've ever noticed this, that when God gave the command to Adam, Eve wasn't even made yet. Oh, you bet. I, and, 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 but, but I never realized that when he gave the command to Adam, Eve wasn't even made. <laughs> Eve is, Adam is, he gives the command to Adam in Genesis 2, 16 and 17. And then once he gives him the command, he says, now go name all the animals. And I don't know how long that took. <laughs> but then it said it was not found to help me suitable for him. And so he doesn't make Eve until verse 22. And so, now I'm sure Adam told her <laughs> about the command, but I, for some reason I had always thought that she, she already knew because she was there when he told him, and, 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 and that is just not the case. But so that, that, one, that one got to me. I, I, I fell out of my chair when I realized that. But the creation of Eve subsequently led to the fall of Adam and Eve, and the curse imposed upon Satan, the serpent. The command ultimately leads to the fall and consequently to the curse imposed upon Satan, which contains, now we have to understand that Genesis 3.15, Genesis 3.15 is going to be the first utterance, the first prophetic utterance of the coming of Jesus Christ to save. Everybody there? The command ultimately leads to the fall and consequently the curse imposed upon Satan, which contains the prophetic utterance of our coming Savior. And he says in Genesis 3.15, And I will put enmity between the you and the woman and between your seed and her seed. And of course, her seed is going to be Jesus Christ. He shall bruise your head, and you shall bruise his heel. He's talking to Satan, and you shall bruise his heel. All right? So he shall bruise your head. In other words, Satan is going to be dealt the death blow, a fatal blow. But Jesus, on the other hand, is going to have to suffer in bruising of his heel. The bruising of Satan's head and the bruising of our Lord's heel came to fruition beginning with the rejection of Jesus as the Christ. So that point reached its, its, its fruition, or yeah, it reached its fruition at the rejection of Jesus Christ. So here we go. Now we're in, now I am on your handout. I still got a couple, one more verse that's not in your handout, but uh, you should be able to play along with me as we go along. All right. So, in concerning the rejection of Jesus Christ, he is first rejected by his own people. And when I say when he's rejected by his own people, he's rejected by the Jews. He's rejected by the Israelites. And that's in John chapter 1, verse 10. He was in the world... And the world was made through him, and the world did not know him. He came to his own, and his own did not receive him. But as many as received him, to them gave he power to become the children of God to those who believe in his name. Now watch. And this is, this is important in this particular context because it says he gave them the right to become the children of God to those who believe in his name who were born not of blood and nor of the will of the flesh, nor of the will of man, but of God. In other words, those who were born and whose salvation had already been worked out, established long before the foundation of the world. Who were born not of blood, nor of the will of the flesh, nor of the will of man, but of God. But, in this particular text, what I'm really trying to highlight is he is rejected. He is rejected 
by the nation. He is rejected by his own people. And then in Matthew 13, Matthew 13, verses 53 through 58, he is rejected by his own country and his own house. His own country. In other words, those who are right there in Bethlehem or uh, Nazareth where, where he was born or where he grew up, they rejected him. He was not only rejected by them, but he was even rejected by his own brothers and sisters. And so it says in Matthew chapter 13, verses 53 to 58, Now it came to pass when Jesus had finished these parables that he departed from there, and when he came to his own country, he taught them in their synagogue, so that they were astonished and said, Where did this man get this wisdom and these mighty works? Is not this the carpenter's son? Is not his mother called Mary? And his brother, James, Joseph, Simon, and Judas, and his sisters, are not they all with us? Where did this man get all these things? So they were offended. They were offended at him. But Jesus said to them, A prophet is not without honor except in his own country and in his own house. He is rejected. So Noah... Now, he did not do many works because of their unbelief. And then he is ultimately rejected by the Jews as well as the chief priests. Yes, thank you, Siri. <laughs> okay. If you look in John chapter 19, verse 14 through 16, he is ultimately rejected by the Jews. And the chief priest, we know the scene, he's before Pilate. Now, it, it was the day of preparation for the Passover. It was about the sixth hour, and he, Pilate, said to the Jews, Look, your king. So they shouted, Away with him. Away with him. Crucify him. Pilate said to him, Shall I crucify your king? The chief priest answered, We have no king except Caesar, so he handed him over to them to be crucified. So now his rejection, so he is rejected by the Jews, he's rejected by the nation of Israel as their Messiah, which ultimately leads to his crucifixion and to his death. So we turn our attention now to the significance of Christ's death. And this is why I say, we can't rush this section because now we're talking about the work of Christ and the significance of his ministry. All right. First, we'll look at the significance of his death uh, is seen as he acts as our substitution. In other words, he's dying and he is, his death is in substitution of ours. Isaiah 53 and 1 says, who hath believed our report? For he shall grow up before him as a tender plant and as a root out of the dry ground. He has no form of comeliness, and when we see him, there is no beauty that we should desire him. In other words, there's nothing about Jesus' appearances, uh, Jesus' appearance that stands out. But this is what stands out. He is despised and rejected of men. He's a man of sorrow and acquainted with grief, and we hid, as it were, our faces from him. He was despised, and we did not esteem him. Surely he has borne our griefs and carried our sorrows, yet we esteemed him stricken, smitten by God, and afflicted. But what does the text say? He was wounded for our transgressions. He was bruised for our iniquities. The chastisement of our peace was upon him, and by his stripes we are healed. All we like sheep have gone astray, we have turned everyone to his own way, and the Lord has laid on him as our substitute, the Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. The Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. I asked the question this morning, 
and I'm going to ask it uh, here as well. You see in verse 5, now I know we understand, but he was wounded for our transgressions, he was bruised for our iniquities. What does that next statement mean? The chastisement of our peace was upon him. What does that mean? And I got some strange answers this morning, so it's a valid question. <laughs> uh, Sheree, you want to go? No, I, I don't think you need the mic tonight because we're not filming. But Okay, but when you say peace, what peace are you talking about? Peace, it, and it's, it's specifically the peace that we have with God. We are no longer at enmity with God. How you doing, Wes? Hey, oh, I, I just recruited you. You just go on over there and stand by the mic. <laughs> Wes, look up for me uh, Romans 5 and 1. You're going you're gonna to help me out and be the reader for the night. You, 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 you okay with that? Yes, sir. All right. No, this one, this one right here is fine. I think it's on. And, and, and if not, you, you, your, your voice will carry. So, uh, Sheree, you're absolutely right. And, and, and this is what, if, this, is, this is not peace of mind and, and, and tranquility and so on and so forth. I am at peace with God. The enmity that was between me and God has been resolved. The chastisement of our peace was upon him. And here, I think the New International Version, and I'm not a big fan of the New International Version. I mean, I'll, I'll read it. But here, the New International Version, I think it translates it best. And it says, the punishment that brought us peace with, uh, the punishment that brought us peace was upon him. And by his stripes, we are healed. Uh, Wes, let me know when you got uh, Romans 5.1. Uh, because it's Romans 5.1 that captures the essence of the peace that was established uh, by the death of Jesus Christ as our substitute. This is Romans 5 and 1 from the ESV, or, the, or, or I'll read the ESV first. Therefore, since we have been justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. We have peace with God. This is not, once again, oh, you know how they say, I can go sit on the ocean and watch the waves and be in a nice, peaceful environment. No, this is the peace that I have with God in whom I was in, in, in my sin, I was at enmity with God. Thank you, Wes. But you can, see, you can uh, just get ready for the next one, too. You want, you, you want to know the next one I'm going to ask you for? 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 21. All right. We're still talking about Jesus as our substitution. Jesus as our substitution. In 1 Peter, 1 Peter 3.18, we read, For Christ also suffered once for sin. Notice what it says. 1 Peter 3.18, The just for the unjust, that he might bring us to God, being put to death in the flesh, but made alive by the Spirit. Jesus is acting as our substitute, the just for the unjust. He was just, we are the unjust. And I, we're going to get to it uh, a little later, but I love that verse that says that, that, Christ, that God did this so that he could be just and the justifier of him who believes in Jesus Christ. Wes, whenever you're ready, I'm ready for a second Corinthians Five and twenty-one. Five and twenty-one. This would be from the NLT. He said, For God made Christ, who never sinned, to be the offend to be the offering for our sin, so that we could be made right with God through Christ. All right. Second Corinthians five and twenty-one, for he made him. 
he made him who knew no sin to be sin for us that we might become the righteousness in God. And one of the things, Pastor, that, that really uh, that, that really was impressed upon me as uh, we have done this study is I am, I am astounded by the humanity of Jesus Christ. I don't care what he went through. He went through it as a man. He suffered as a man. His temptation was as a man. And it was, it was because, for he made him who knew no sin to be sin for us, that we might become the righteous in uh, righteous of, righteousness of God in Christ Jesus. We'll have more to say about that in a minute. And then the significance of the death of Christ is seen as he acts on our behalf for our redemption. And in acting on our behalf for our redemption, he acts as our kinsman redeemer. He acts as our kinsman redeemer. Wes, would you look up for me Galatians chapter 4, verses 4 and 5. And while you're looking that up, I'm going to read uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 6, verse 20. Now remember now, we have been redeemed. And in, 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 in the, uh, the essence of being redeemed is we have been bought. And so there it is in 1 Corinthians chapter 6, verse 20. For you have been bought with a price. You have been bought with a price. Therefore glorify God in your body and in your spirit which are God's. All right, well, let's go ahead with uh, Galatians. Uh, Fourth chapter, four and five. You got it. Okay. But when the fullness of the, I'm reading from the ESV, from the, when the fullness of the time had come, God sent forth his son, born of, born of woman, born under the law, to redeem those who were under the law, so that we might receive, an ad receive adoption as sons. All right, thank you very much. Now, what do you think he's pointing to when he says, but when the fullness of time had come? Okay, I'll, I'll, I'll buy that, but what did he mean, the fullness of time? Okay, keep going. Go deeper. How many of you wait all year for your birthday? Wait for your work birthday, and when the fullness of time comes, it's your birthday. <laughs> because you waited for it, right? You waited for it. But in this context, what does the fullness of time mean? Time is right. Taking into consideration that the, your, your salvation was established before the foundation of the world. So the fullness of time is the culminating event in which your salvation was secured. Because when the fullness of time had come, all that God predestined, all that God had planned before the foundation of the world, all right, all that was necessary to secure your salvation. I mean, the words uttered from the cross are profound when Jesus says, it is finished. That was the fullness of time when all that God had foreordained, foresaw, it's the moment, I always like, and I look at it like this. It's the moment that what was prophesied became history. Come on. The fullness of time, that which was necessary to secure your redemption, to secure your salvation, was now done. But when the fullness of time had come, God sent forth his son, born of a woman, born under the law, to redeem those who were under the law that we might receive the adoption as sons. Now, that which has been prophesied has become our reality. See? 
Somebody said, God is the only one who could look at the future and see it as the past. But we have to experience, we have to go through these points in time. All right? And then, uh, let's see where I'm going to have you go next. Uh, uh, Wes, Wes, how about uh, getting, uh, getting ready for me, Romans chapter 3, verse 21 and 25. All right? The significance of Christ's death is seen as he is our propitiation. Got to find me something to illustrate this. You said 21 and 25? Uh, we're going to read verses 21 through 25. All right, so we say the significance of the death of Christ is seen as he is our propitiation. Now, I think you should have that in your handout. You have the propitiation. I don't have to spell that for you. All right, because I flunked the spelling B. <laughs> All right. Now, what is propitiation? What is pro propitiation? Let me make sure you understand the difference between uh, propitiation and uh, be careful, Wes, you might, it might say expiation in the, uh, in the ESV, uh, but uh, expiation is not the word we're looking for. We're looking for a propitiation because here's the difference. Here's the difference between the two. Propitiation refers to the turning away of the wrath of God as the just judgment for our sins by God's own provision of the sacrifice of Jesus Christ on the cross. We know that it says in Romans, or, or not in Romans, but in Hebrews, for without the shedding of blood, there is no remission of sin. Now, this is opposed to expiation, which was common to the Old Testament sacrificial system. Here's the difference between expiation and and propitiation. Everybody watching, look up here for a minute. You see this? Expiation, I cover your sins. Your sins are covered. That's all that the Old Testament sacrificial system did. It covered their sins, and they had to do this every year, every night. You know, every, I mean, they, they offered sin offerings every night, but then, of course, the, uh, the Day of Atonement came once a year. Came in October, by the way, Sister Livingston. <laughs> okay. But Jesus is our propitiation. Jesus does not cover our sins. Here it is. Everybody looking? Everybody looking? He takes them away. He takes our sins away. He takes away, hold on a minute, I got some more, uh, there it is, I don't want to lose my, my spot. So that's the difference between propitiation and expiation. Expiation is just the appeasement of your sin. And you, you got to go and do it again. And, and this is the one thing that you got to understand about the Old Testament sacrificial system. The Old Testament sacrificial system, there was nothing in place to deal with intentional sin. This was, it was always for unintentional sins, all right? But that's why, that's why it says if you got caught in adultery, <laughs> you don't go to get forgiven for that. You get stoned. <laughs> okay. Oh, we, you bet we're going to say that, especially when we get into the offices of Christ, and we may even get to that tonight. And one of the things that uh, uh, when, I, when, when, when I'm going through the offices of Christ, the, the main office that I want to, ex the, the, the main one that I want to deal with and stress is his uh, office of, of the priest. And I'll even, I'll, I'll even give, it, give it away tonight. you got to remember that his office as the priest is 
the most significant office as is relative to the church age today. I mean, he's prophet, priest, and king. He's going, I mean, yeah. And here we talk about the, the already and the not yet. He's already king, but he's not yet. Everybody with me there? But right now, he is our high priest. And this is why I don't know who wrote the book of Hebrews, but the book of Hebrews is profound because it's going to do just what you said. It's going to talk about not only is he the offering, but he's the high priest that offers it. And I think, this is just me, and, I, and, and, and don't, 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 don't take this to, as, as uh, take this on, on author, as authoritative, but I think this is what he meant when he said uh, to Mary Magdalene, I have not yet ascended to my father. She says, don't touch me because I have not yet ascended unto my father. And, I, and, I, and I, this is just me, I'm, and I may be wrong as two left shoes, but he hadn't presented the sacrifice yet. That is talked about in Hebrews. When it talks about him not entering the Holy of Holies made with hands, but that's when I think he goes up. That's just me in my little, in my little pea brain mind. All right, so when we talk about propitiation, it implies taking away the penalty of sin. It implies being set free from the bondage of sin because we, come, we get all of this in Christ Jesus, and it implies that one day we will be free from the very presence of sin, for Jesus Christ was, in fact, the Lamb of God who not covers but he takes the sin away. He takes the sin away. And I, me and Pastor were talking earlier, and I'm going to probably get to this uh, a little later. Yeah, it's, it's coming up in, uh, when we take a look at 1 John, the difference between sin and sins. Sin isn't talking about our nature, correct, Pastor? Talking about our nature when it's, when it's singular. And I, I went back and took a look at that passage. In 8, it is sin. And in verse 9, it is sin. But we'll talk about that. Sheree will be there in a little bit. All right? But uh, Wes is going to read for us Romans chapter 3, verse 21 through 25. And I think this is, and here again, it's just me. This is just what I think. So don't take it as an authority or anything. But I think Romans chapter 3. Verses 21 through 25, as a matter of fact, going all the way through about 28. You'll stop at 25 for me, Wes. But uh, no, 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 you'll stop at 26. Yeah, you got to go 26 as well. But um, I think that's the most important paragraph in the whole Bible. Go ahead, uh, uh, Wes. Thank you, sir. All right. And for this, I have switched over to the NSAB. But now apart from the law, the righteousness of God has been revealed being witnessed by the law and the prophets. Okay, hold up right there. But now the righteousness of God apart from the law is being revealed. What does he mean when he says being witnessed by the law and the prophets? The birth of Christ. Being witnessed by the law and the prophets is speaking to the totality of the Old Testament. Mm. That's where you have the law, and that's where you have the prophets. Being witnessed by the law and the prophets. Keep, keep going, Wes, I'm sorry. Oh, no problem. But it is the righteousness of God through the faith in Jesus Christ for all those who, who believe. For there is no distinction, for all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God being justified as a gift by his grace through the redemption which is in Christ Jesus, whom God displayed publicly as, as, as a propitiation there you go. in his blood through faith. This was to demonstrate his righteousness because in God's merc merciful restraint, he, he, let the sins, he let the sins previously committed Go unpunished. 26, for the demonstration that is of his righteousness at the, same, at the present time so that he would be, would, would be just 
and the justifier, who would be just and, just and the justifier of one who has faith in, in Jesus. Okay? That he might be just and the justifier of the one who has faith in Jesus Christ. You have to understand that the major attribute of God is holiness. And under no circumstances does the, the God has never has and he never will compromise his holiness. Even the love of God is not going to cause God to compromise his holiness. The love of God is always expressed in the confines of his holiness. And here's another secret about the love of God. The love of God is always expressed in the confines of redemption. God just does not love willy-nilly. It's always expressed within the confines of redemption, and it's always expressed within the confines of his holiness. God never has, again, he never has and he never will compromise his holiness. So now the righteousness of God is revealed apart from the law, being witnessed by the law and the prophets, because you have to understand, and I'm kind of got to make sure I don't get, get too far ahead of myself, but you got to understand that the law was not abolished. The law was not abolished. The law in its entirety was fulfilled. Now, I took them over to, I don't, and I was trying to remember if I did, I did it here, if I did it here or did it someplace else. But let me just take you there right now. Let me take you to Romans chapter 8. Let me take you to Romans chapter 8. And I only want to go there. I won't, I won't do what I did earlier today, Pastor. I won't make that point about, uh, about verse 1. I'll, let, I'll just let that one go for the night. But I do want you to see this, though. I want you to see this because, am I there? The righteousness of God. Okay, even the righteousness of God. I'm in, I'm in Romans chapter 8. I'm in Romans chapter 8, and I'm reading from the New American Standard Bible. All right, everybody with me? Therefore, there is now no condemnation to those who are in Christ Jesus. I want you to pay attention to verse 2. For the law of the spirit of life in Christ Jesus has set me free from the law of sin and death. And then pay attention to verse 3. For what the law could not do, weak as it was through the flesh, God did by sending his own son in the likeness of sinful flesh. And as an offering for sin, he condemned sin in the flesh so that the righteous requirement of the law, the righteous requirement of the law, the righteousness that should have been able to be obtained from the law, which never was, but so that the righteous requirement of the law might be fulfilled in us who do not walk according to the flesh, but according to the spirit. So I'm going to ask you the same question that I asked them this morning. What was it that the law could not do? You see that in verse 3? For what the law could not do. Why couldn't it do it? What is it that the law can't do that the spirit of life in Christ can do? You see that in verse 2? For the law of the spirit of life in Christ Jesus has set me free from the law of sin and death. What is it that the law of the spirit of Christ can do that the law could not do? The law cannot sanctify. The law the law, all, all the law could do was condemn. We're, and we're going to see this in a minute from when, when it talks about the handwriting that were written against us and Jesus took it out of the way and nailed it to the cross. We're going to see that in a minute. But it's important to understand the role of the Holy Spirit in your life. It is the Holy Spirit 
that is bringing about your sanctification because you don't have the power within you to do it yourself. And so he says, look at, look at it again. There is therefore now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. For those who are in Christ Jesus, for the law of the spirit of life in Christ has set me free from the law of sin and death for what the law could not do weak as it was through the flesh. It is the sanctifying ministry. It is the power of God transforming us. The power of God working in us and transforming us from being in the image and the likeness of Adam into the image and the likeness of Jesus Christ. It is that spiritual transformation that's taking part in us each and every day. And I always say this, I didn't say it this morning, but the Pentecostals have given you a bag of goods, a, 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 a false bag of goods, because what does the Pentecostal say? And, I, and you've, seen, you've seen me, you heard me say this before, but back in the day, they used to say, have you been filled with the Holy Spirit with the evidence of speaking in tongues? And I remember one lady, I'm, on, I'm waiting for the bus. <laughs> she, said, she says to me, have you been filled with the Holy Spirit with the evidence of speaking in tongues? I said, no. <laughs> and so they put this stress on speaking in tongues and speaking in tongues is not the evidence of anything. And I like how Pastor Campbell used to say it. The, 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 the uh, possessing a spiritual gift is not a sign of spiritual maturity. Something like that, he used to, Pastor used to say. Here it is. And I'm going to ask the question. What is the evidence of being filled with the Holy Spirit? Go ahead, Brother Green. All right, but what is the evidence? What is the evidence that you are born again and that you are filled with the Holy Spirit? Okay, keep going. Okay, I'll take the fruit of the Spirit. What are, what's the evidence? Because remember what the law could not do in that it was weak through the flesh. Okay, I'll buy that. The evidence that you are filled with the Holy Spirit of the living God is you walk in the Spirit. Verse 4. You walk, this is uh, Romans chapter 8, verse 4. You walk in the Spirit and you do not fulfill the lust of the flesh. Do you know that people who speak in the tongues, they do... <laughs> <laughs> are sometimes found fulfilling the lust of the flesh <laughs> and the lust of the eyes. <laughs> so the evidence that you are, and, 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 and you have to understand that God fills us with the Holy Spirit, and we talked about this, we always talk about this, there's a distinction between the baptism of the Holy Spirit, Right? and the filling of the Holy Spirit. Why does pastor say we need to constantly be filled with the Holy Spirit? Because we're leaky vessels. So I'm, I'm baptized in the Holy Spirit once when I'm baptized into the body of Christ. But I am constantly keeping myself being filled with the Holy Spirit of the living God through prayer, through and it says, uh, be not drunk with wine, but be filled with the Holy Spirit, speaking to yourselves in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing and making melody in your heart to the Lord. These are the things that keep me constantly filled with the Spirit in prayer, in, in, in uh, uh, memorizing Scripture, keeping these things on your mind. Why? Because temptation is still going to come. But because of my constant effort to be filled with the Holy Spirit, when temptation comes, I don't succumb to it. Yeah. I don't succumb to the lust of the eyes. I don't succumb to the lust of the flesh. I don't succumb to the pride of life. Remember, the law could not sanctify, but the Holy Spirit is sanctifying me daily 
as he continues once again to transform me from the sinful image and likeness of Adam into the image of Jesus Christ. Let me see how far I got off my point, and I'll get right back on it. We talked about, oh, okay, him as our kinsman redeemer. Oh, and again, as our propitiation. And so propitiation implies taking away the penalty of sin. It implies being set free from the bondage of sin. And I, and I intentionally didn't go into this when we were talking about the impeccability of Jesus Christ. And, and, uh, and, and the reason I didn't go into it is when we were talking about the impeccability of Jesus Christ was because this deals more with, with man and man's problem. Uh, man is, <laughs> before the fall, before the fall, Adam was able to sin and he was able not to sin. Everybody with me? But because of the fall, man lost the ability to be able not to sin. Why? Because he is now in bondage to sin. And so, and you've heard me use the example, why does a dog bark? A dog barks because he's a dog. Why does a sinner sin? He sinned because he's a sinner and he is in bondage to sin. But that bondage is immediately broke when I accept Jesus Christ as my Lord and Savior. And now I'm right there in 1 Corinthians 10, 13. There hath no temptation taken you, but such as is common to man. But God is faithful. God is faithful who will not allow you to be tempted above what you are able, but with every temptation, he'll always, always, always make a way to escape because now you have the power to bear it. And that's why I always say, that's why I always say, Christians do not sin because they're weak. When a Christian sins, a Christian is exercising the power and authority of his flesh. Because God has made a way. Some stories I can't tell when Sheree's in church. <laughs> but I, was, I think I told y'all this story. But I was in Zurich, Switzerland, and the piano player called herself liking some Greg Young. <laughs> I went to my room, I locked that door. I said, nigga, if you touch that lock, I'll kill you. <laughs> the Lord made a way for me to escape. All right, Sheree, I think I told you that one before. Okay, all right. <laughs> but we have the power. Okay, propitiation. All right, uh, I got to move on. I got to move on. Oh, yeah, I really got to move on. Okay. And then the significance of Christ's death is seen as he secures our forgiveness, as he for secures our forgiveness. I do believe. Uh, Wes, you ready for me? How about Colossians chapter 2? Uh, I think you're going to read 13, 14, and 15. But I think this is the principal passage showing our relationship between the law and what Jesus did on our behalf. I think it's, uh, okay, we'll see. We'll, we'll see what... I think it's 13, 14, and 15. Go ahead. Colossians. Colossians. Second chapter 13, reading from the NSAB. And when you were dead in your wrongdoings and, and, the, circum and the uncircumcision of your flesh, he made, he, made your, he made you alive together with him. Him, uh, ha having, forgive, having forgiven us of all wrongdoings, Having, con having canceled the certificate of debt consisting of, of the decrees against us, which was hostile to us, and has taken it out, out of the way, having nailed it to the cross. Okay, that's where I need you to stop. All right. So the handwriting of ordinances that were written against us, what were those? The law. 
all of us are aware that based on the law, we are condemned. Based on the law, we are all condemned. Because, uh, and the, I mean, uh, sheesh, I don't even want to think about how many of the Ten Commandments I done broke. But the, the, the totality of the law, none of us could live up to it, correct? correct? And you being dead in your trespasses and in the uncircumcision of your flesh, he has made alive together with him, having forgiven all your trespasses, having wiped out the handwriting of the requirements that was written against us, which was contrary to us, because we were all condemned by it. He has taken it out of the way, and he's nailed it to the cross. Now, I rephrased the question this morning that I asked this morning. I rephrased it today. Is this because Jesus abolished the law? He did not abolish the law. He fulfilled every letter of the law. Go ahead, Wes. Um, can I read this real quick? This is uh, the same verse up in, in NLT, the different version. Okay. Okay. It says, you were dead because of your sins. And because your sin, your sinful nature, was not yet cut away, then God made alive with Christ. For he, for he forgave all of your sins. He canceled the record of the charges against, against us and took it away by nailing it to the cross. Amen. And that's what he did. All right. The significance of Christ's death is seen as he secures our forgiveness. Let's go ahead and go 1 John, and, and we'll read both 8 and, uh, 1 John 8 and 9. I got to get it too. I got 9 in my notes, but I don't have 8. Uh, this is a point that Pastor was making this morning, and I want to make it uh, as well. Everybody there, 1 John 1, looking at verse 8. If we say that we have no sin, did you notice that sin is singular? Yes. All right. If we have no sin, we are deceiving ourselves, and the truth is not in us. If we confess our sins, you see that one is plural? Okay. He is faithful and just to forgive us of our sins and to cleanse us from all righteousness. If we say we have not sinned, we make him a liar, and his word is not in us. And what Paul Pastor was talking about this morning, he says in verse 8, the, the fact that it is singular is pointing out our sinful nature. If we say that we have not sinned, we have no sinful nature, and that was, that was an argument of the Gnostics, okay? Uh, we are deceiving ourselves, and the truth is not in us. But if we confess our sins, if we confess our sins, he is faithful and just. And again, the significance of the death of Christ is seen as he secures our forgiveness. He is faithful and just to forgive us of our sins, and he will cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Remember, the cleansing of unrighteousness could not be done by the law. That is the whole function of the, of the indwelling ministry of the Holy Spirit He's washing away stuff, washing away stuff. Every day, something should be falling off. I should not be so, so easily to succumb to the lust of the eyes, the lust of the flesh, and the pride of life. Because he's working on those very things that cause us to fall. Then we see that the significance of the death of Christ is seen as he was raised for our justification. In Romans chapter 3, verse 28, therefore we conclude that a man is justified by faith apart from the deeds of the law. Your justification, then, well, let's see, I, was, I didn't ask this question this morning, but I'll ask it now. What is the difference between sanctification and justification? Okay. Stand up and say that real loud for us, uh, Brother Taylor. If you don't mind standing up. It is the judicial act of God. You stand justified before God as the result of just uh, judicial act. It's like being black. 
It is a state of being. <laughs> Anybody question whether they black or not? Well, let's see. I think I'm part Mexican today. <laughs> it is a state. It is a state of being. By a judicial act of God, you have been declared righteous. Everybody there? So what's the difference between justification and sanctification? Yes. Say it loud. Say it loud. Yeah, and uh, D Dave does a very good job of... Uh, talking about the stages of sanctification. I am being sanctified. My position in Christ dies is I'm already sanctified. Right? I'm already Christ. As a matter of fact, the chain is listed over there in Romans chapter 8. Come on, come on. I, oh, shucks, I only got 10 minutes. Oh, boy, I got to finish up. All right. Romans chapter 8, Romans chapter 8, verse 20, 30, here we go, but I'll start at 28, and we know that all things work to good, they're for good, for those who love God, to those who are called according to his purpose, here it is, verse 29, for those whom he foreknew, when did he foreknow them? Before the foundation of the world, he also predestined, conformed to the image of his son, all right? so that he would be the firstborn among many brethren. Now watch. And those whom he predestined, he also called. And those whom he called, he also justified. And those whom he justified, he also glorified. All right? And so we see the whole process in play. And I like how Paul says, he says over in Philippians chapter 3, oh, somewhere around verse 10 or so, he says, so that I may lay hold of that for which Christ Jesus has also laid hold of me. In other words, Christ already sees me justified. He already sees me sanctified. But I want to be there. I want to pursue that. I want to pursue the sanctification that he already has established and sees me as sanctified. In other words, that which he has done on my behalf I want to work at doing. Everybody with me? That I may lay hold of that for which he is Christ has also laid hold of me. All right. Then let's consider the significance of Christ's resurrection. Hold on. Did I, did I get all of that? Did, oh, raised for our justification. Let me uh, go back to Romans 5. Romans 5. I'm just going to read verse 1 and verse 9. Therefore, having been justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. And then verse 9, much more than having now been justified by his blood, we shall be saved from the wrath through him. Then let's consider the significance of the resurrection of Christ. And as I told them this morning, the, the is it called the Magna Carta? Is that the, uh, something. But the, but the, high, <laughs> the high point, the, the, the chapter that uh, says more, uh, to, to validate the importance of resurrection is going to be 1 Corinthians chapter 15. 1 Corinthians chapter 15. I'm going to read verses 12 through 19. Um, Wes, you get uh, 1 through 5 for me in, uh, in uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 15. But, uh, and was this what, Pastor, was this what the sermon was from? Yeah, yeah, I thought, I thought that's what the sermon was from this, uh, this last Sunday. Now, if Christ has preached that he has been raised from the dead, then how say some of you that there is no resurrection of the dead? But if there is no resurrection of the dead, then Christ is not risen. And if Christ is not risen, our preaching is empty and your faith is also empty. Yes, we have found false witnesses of God because we have testified that God has raised up Christ whom he did not raise up, if in fact the dead do not rise. 
For if the dead do not rise, then Christ is not risen. And if Christ is not risen, your faith is futile. You are still in your sins. Then also, those who have fallen asleep in Christ have perished. If in this life only we have hope in Christ, we are men the most pitiable. The certainty of the resurrection, the dynamics of the resurrection, the intricacies of the resurrection are all right there in 1 Corinthians chapter 15. And I love how it ends. It says, in the moment, in the twinkling of an eye, we shall all be changed. All right? So the significance of the resurrection of Christ and then, of course, the proof of the resurrection of Christ. Luke 24, 13, 48. Uh, he's uh, talking with the disciples on the road to Emmaus, to Emmaus. In John chapter 20, verses 7 and 8, John and Peter enter an empty tomb. In John 20 and uh, 24 through 31, the disciples see the Lord. In Acts 24 through 32, I read uh, 24 and 22 to 24, pre Peter preaches on the day of Pentecost. He says, men of Israel, hear these words. Jesus of Nazareth, a man attested by God to you by miracles, wonders, and signs, which God did through him in your midst, as ye have also know, he being delivered up by the determined purpose and foreknowledge of God, what was determined of, and what was the determined purpose and foreknowledge of God that he established long before the foundation of the world? You have taken by lawless hands, have crucified and put to death, whom God raised up, having loosed the pains of death because it was not possible that he should be held by it. And then, of course, the message of the gospel as it is preached in 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verse 1 through 5. Go ahead, Wes. In the SAB. <clears throat> now I make known to you, now, now I make known to you, brothers and sisters, the gospel which I preached to you, which you also receive, received, in, in, in which you also stand, by which you also are saved. If you hold firmly to the word which I preach to you, unless you believe in vain. For I hand down to you as the first, as the first importance what I also received that Christ died for our sins according Amen. to the scriptures. And that he was buried and that he was raised on the third day according to the scriptures. And that he appeared to the Cephas then to the 12. Continue. Nope, that's it. All right. Proof of the resurrection of Jesus Christ. And you are walking and living proof of the resurrection of Jesus Christ because he has made himself known in your life. I got five minutes. Let's take a look at the facts attesting to the ascension of Christ. We have the testimony of Luke. In Luke 24 and 51, while he was blessing them, he left them and was taken up into heaven. And then we also have the testimony of Luke in the book of Acts. Now when he had spoken these things, and I'm in Acts chapter 1, verses 9 through 11. Now when he had spoken these things, while they watched, he was taken up, and a cloud received him out of their sight. And while they looked steadfastly towards heaven, as he went up, behold, two men stood by them in white apparel, who also said, Men of Galilee, why do you stand gazing up into heaven? The same Jesus who was taken up from you into heaven will come, will so come in like manner as you see him go into heaven. Then we have the testimony of the writer of the book of Hebrews. In chapter 4, verses 4 through 16, he says, Seeing then, that we have a great high priest who has passed through the heavens, Jesus, the Son of God, let us hold fast our confession, for we do not have a high priest who cannot sympathize with our weaknesses, but was in all points tempted as we are, yet without sin. So let us therefore boldly come to the throne of grace, that we may obtain mercy and find help in the time 
of need. And this one I found very interesting. This is the testimony of King David. The testimony of King David in Psalms 110 and 1. The Lord said to my Lord, sit at my right hand till I make your enemies your footstool. And then last but not least, and we'll close on this one, the testimony of Peter. The testimony of Peter in 1 Peter chapter 3, verse 22. He say he, oh, uh, I may have typed this wrong, but he who has gone into heaven and at the right hand of God, angels and authorities and powers have been made subject to him. So we know, we can attest to the fact that Jesus Christ has been raised from the dead. And again, when we start talking about the offices of Christ, we're going to talk about his, his position uh, as priest and making intercession for us. And so that's where he is on the right hand of God saying, Lord, I know Wes is a mess. <laughs> but I'm in a seat on his back. And so God, uh, Jesus Christ is at the right hand of God interceding on our behalf. Any questions? Man, I finished right on time. You understand? Right. Uh, I do not know. I do not know. I, but uh, the Jehovah Witnesses are the only ones that I know that believe only 144,000 have a heavenly calling. And it's interesting because if you look at the 144,000 in the book of the Revelation of Jesus Christ, there are 144,000 Jews of the 12 tribes and how they have made themselves Jews of the 12 tribes of Israel is beyond me. But I did sit in one of their Bible studies and they call them the John class, the 144,000. <laughs> Yeah, and, and they're going to use, they're going to use, uh, I want to say it's Revelation 21, where he's behold a new heaven and a new earth, and uh, they're going to be the inhabitants of the new earth. <laughs> but they, we, we, we'll, we'll be in the new Jerusalem. <laughs> we have a heavenly calling, all of us. Remember what Jesus said, behold, I go to prepare a place for you that where I am, there you may be also. All right? Any other questions? Oh, my goodness. Amen, amen. She in the Midwest? Oh, yeah, okay. That's one thing I used to say about Memphis, boy. In Memphis, weather happens. <laughs> you be in there, you be watching the news and seeing that thunderstorm roll through. I say, I ain't got to watch the news. I got to look out the window. <laughs> oh, yeah, boy. Storm tracker, storm tracker, yeah. Weather happens down there. Well, praise the Lord, your mother's all right. Amen. All right. Shall we pray and be on our way? Now we will finish this. Uh, we'll finish this next week, and uh, uh, there will be a test. <laughs> our Father and our God, our Lord and our Savior, we want to thank you and praise you for what our ears have heard and what our eyes have seen, and we want to thank you, Lord, that we are living witnesses of your resurrection. For you have made yourself known to each and every one of us in a personal and intimate way. We ask, O oh God, now that you watch over us protect us and keep us as we go our separate ways. Oh God, in the name of Jesus, remember our pastor tonight. Oh God, we just thank you for him and ask you to keep, keep him, watch over him, protect him. 
In Jesus' name we pray, amen.